Lecture 11, uh, and we're going to explore genomes today and touch upon annotations of genomes in R mostly. All right. Not surprisingly, genomes are very common in bioinformatics, data science, computational biology. Uh, uh, they can range, they have a huge range in sizes from uh, viruses, small to big, mostly flowering plants. Uh, there's a nice shiny app here. Uh, that um, somebody created. I'm not sure their name. It's a bit weird to me. But uh, this, this automatically pulls the NCBI um, in the collection of genomes that are represented there, which is basically everything. And it plots this nice um, uh, scatter plot for genome size versus uh, the number of genes in the genome. And um, well, you can see that viruses, these green guys here, uh, range from just above 100 base pairs all the way up to, I guess this would be. The largest ones, these are the called, I think they're called gyruses, giant viruses. Um, they would be 10 to the 5, so that would be, I think, uh, 100,000, maybe even close to 1 million base pairs. Bacteria and archaebacteria are in here, and you can see that um, the bacteria are slightly, have a slightly larger range of um, genome sizes, up to, I would think this is like, what, 10, tens of millions? Um, and the number of protein coding genes in this dimension is a little bit more variable for bacteria, whereas archaea it's really one to one in a sense. And then of course you have the eukaryota, including us, way up here, and you see that there's some eukaryota with giant genomes with very few genes. Uh, and these these genes, uh, these organisms up here, tend to be flowering plants. I believe the largest genome is the um, is, is a Japanese uh, flower. Uh, and it, I believe, has actually 10 to the 11 um, base pairs, so it must be really on the edge of here. Okay. So some are circular, including viruses and prokaryotes. Um, so a prokaryote be, uh, you know, either an archaea or bacteria, something with a nucleus, or the mitochondria of eukaryota. Uh, and some are linear, like the eukaryota. Um, and there's some actual bacteria that have linear genomes, including this guy here, Borrelia burgdorferi. And um, I don't know how many of you ever had this disease. Uh, I had it a few years ago, and it wasn't very pleasant. Um, I'll leave it to you to answer that little trivia question. Um, and then there's cancer genomes. Uh, and the hallmark, we're going to come back to, uh, we're going to dedicate a whole lecture to talking about genomic instability in cancer as a hallmark and how to model it. In fact, I, I think my personal opinion is that it's almost a defining feature of cancer, this ability of cells to evolve uh, very rapidly. Um, it's this neoplasticity, this ability to mutate of cancer genomes that can give uh, novel point mutations or amplifying certain genes like we've already discussed her two it is amplified in breast cancer uh, other genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 which you may know from the common um, you know literature not literature but the common media there's much talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2 in breast cancer as risk factors they, they, they correspond to point mutations a point mutation is an individual nucleotide that is flipped or switched Chromosomal amplifications, loss, loss of heterozygosity, aneuploidies, and euploidies affect entire chromosomes or, or large portions of them. Uh, then you can have things like uh, loss, where a region is lost. So let's say uh, a gene like TP53, which is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the genome. If that region of DNA is lost, then one copy of TP53 won't be there in that cell, and that might weaken the cell, or, or at least uh, uh, it might um, uh, have an impact that there's only one uh, of two copies left. And it, it may reduce the heterozygosity because we're uh, diploid organisms losing, you know, we, are, we have two copies of each gene and there may be minor differences between them, like point mutations. And losing one copy means that we lose that, um, that uh, diversity, right, that, that heterozygosity. 
and uh, aneuploidies and euploidies like amplification affect regions of a gene. And this is an actual picture from, I believe, a, um, I believe a, a lung cancer. Um, and basically here, they, they, these circus plots, they plot each chromosome, one, two, three, four, all the way to 22, and then X and Y in this kind of uh, circular way. And then the, you can see here, each of these internal arcs between positions, like for example, this guy that goes between chromosome 18 and chromosome 14, it means that part of the um, uh, chromosome 18 has been now fused with chromosome 14 um, in that cancer cell. And that can bring two genes together in close pro proximity and create fusion genes. Um, I think that's uh, one of the, one of the I've, I've known fusion genes that put drive lymphomas. Um, in other cases, you bring a gene into the, um, with, with these kind of flips in the genome, in that now it's placed under control of a different promoter, so it's not being expressed when it normally would be in a healthy you know, um, uh, cell. So this neoplasticity or instability of the genomes has a big impact. And you might recall from, I think, lecture two or three, way back when, um, that we talked about uh, the need to sequence um, cancers. So we're not just sequencing an individual um, once, but we're sequencing maybe that person's uh, tumor as it evolves from being a non-invasive disease, maybe even in situ, through to a metastasis in different organs. And each time you would sequence it, you'll find that the collection of abnormal genomic events has changed. Uh, it's a good question. Well, how many genomes have been sequenced to date? I mean, uh, we can talk about this in class a little bit. It's kind of interesting to estimate. Uh, I, one question is, have any of you been uh, sequenced? I have, uh, but um, uh, I think it's becoming more commonplace now. Uh, it depends a little bit on how you count in terms of how many genomes have been sequenced. Um, of course, we could talk about the organismal, le organismal level, um, and that would be, the, for example, the genomes at the NCBI, but some organisms have, have multiple assemblies. I think I have perhaps an example here. This is the list of genomes at the NCBI, and I hope that you can see this well enough. Um, there's something like... Uh, 56,000 there, um, uh, of which 13,000 are um, eukaryotic. But you can, you can see that, for example, even here in this uh, stenoarchaea, it's one organism, a very probably some seemingly obscure organism, has multiple different sequencing, so maybe different strains of that same organism. And that, that's, that's true for many, um, many organisms. Like at the um, this Abutilian mosaic from Bolivia versus from Brazil, etc., and there's far too many. Uh, the list of genomes is far too too large to go through by uh, here by hand. Okay, <coughs> and of course some organisms have multiple assemblies. Uh, hopefully you understand intuitively what an assembly is, but you, you know when you sequence with a sequencer a genome. It doesn't come out the other end completely sequenced. Okay, uh, there are some exceptions these days. There's new long, what are called long read technologies that are capable of reading small bacteria and archaebacteria from one end to the other. Um, but uh, for large eukaryota, for example, that's not feasible. And there's a, you, you sequence little fragments of it and then you have to assemble those little pieces like a puzzle into an assembly. And of course, all sorts of things in that process. I mean, there's a whole science there of sequencing that we aren't going to look at in this course. Um, that's really fascinating and it's a really challenge. Things like telomeres and centromeres, highly repetitive regions, um, uh, lines and signs and retrotransposons, uh, they confuse the process of assembly um, because they're repetitive or uh, they're um, showing up in many places in the genome. Okay, and then if some organisms have been sequenced many, many times, and that would be at least uh, human. Um, 23andMe, for example, is a company which 
maybe many of you have heard of, I'm not sure, some of you may have, have already used the service. Uh, you know, it makes a great Christmas gift. Um, uh, if you're interested in becoming sequenced, you can just speak with me. No, it's not very hard to do to get your whole genome. Now, 2023 and Me doesn't sequence all of your genome. It's, it sequences hotspots. Let's call them hotspots in your genome or certain loci that they know are associated with disease. So, for example, they would sequence the region of um, where for Huntington's disease and they would sequence the transmembrane um, gene um, CFTR. Uh, cystic fibrosis um, related uh, transmembrane protein and that's that's what that protein is what is involved or causes the disease phenotype of cystic fibrosis and there's specific mutations like the delta 508 is your most common cystic fibrosis um, type although there's multiple types so so 23andme is a company I believe it's in, from Stanford uh, it's had lots of media attention. Um, it's questions about what it's doing with all that data and is that data appropriate to be used in clinical trials? Um, all sorts of things. Uh, you, you know, uh, on this note right now, um, it, it's not just 23andMe nowadays that are sequencing people's genomes or parts of their genomes uh, as a service. Uh, and you can see that the service is really not very expensive per se. Um, other ones uh, where you can sequence um, at least part of your genome for Ancestry. I think Ancestry.com now has a sequencing service. And so uh, and, and it turns out that those kinds of um, genealogical dust, dust, um, databases that are coming out of that are actually solving a lot of cold cases, including um, one from Jessica. Um, oh, my. I have lost her name. I'm going to look it up right now. But as I was growing up in um, Ontario, uh, let's see if I can find it right here. Uh, Paul Moran was a person that was accused of a brutal murder of a small, a young girl. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Christine Jessup. And um, this was recently. This was back in the 80s when it happened, when I was quite young. And um, I remember um, Guy Paul Moran being arrested and the accusations against him. And eventually he was found not guilty, I believe. Um, but, uh, you know, it always hung over his head. And it was just actually a couple of days ago that um, genealogical DNA testing um, clear, cleared him and they actually found the true true killer okay so um, and and some uh, some organisms especially viruses um, there's one that you might have heard of uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 um, where it's very interesting to track individual strains um, almost in real time these days. Uh, this includes, um, for, this is actually the genome, uh, which runs around 33,000 base pairs long of SARS-CoV-2, okay? And um, I'm gonna show you something in a second, but this is uh, a, phylo or a multiple sequence alignment of closely related viruses. We have SARS in human down at the bottom here. Uh, and then we have 2019, the Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2, uh, and then um, USA here, et cetera. And you can see that there's quite a bit conserved across um, the old SARS uh, from a few years ago. And, um, our, you know, the one that we all know and the test that we're with, with right now in this region up here. And... Um, that's a small fragment of this complete genome. Uh, this is a uh, just Trevor Bedford is an amazing researcher, and uh, this is really a, a truly amazing website. Um, I'll show you here. You can explore all sorts of uh, different versions of this, but um, let's see here. This is worth a watch. Um, 
down, uh, let me explain before I, I do this. So this is, of course, the world. Uh, and these are all strains of SARS, uh, of COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, that have been sequenced um, since uh, January. I think there's probably a couple thousand now, if not more. And um, this is the, uh, this here is the evolutionary phylogeny of those, how those genomes are evolving. And we're going to look at phylogeny in a couple lectures. And down here, this is the um, stretch of the, uh, this stretches the entire genome of SARS-CoV-2 from 0 to around 3,300 base pairs. And if you watch here in this movie, what you there, I can scroll it up just a little bit to get everything on the screen. This is, um, you're gonna, you can see how this is evolving a little bit. I put this on um, entropy at the amino acid level, so it shows you sort of what sites are changing. Okay, and um, yeah, so let's see here. I'm going to play it medium, and we should be good to go and play. Um, so here is back in January, and it's spreading in the world, and the colors represent location. And you can see as it spreads, right, this virus is really evolving. If you come into here, they're all the North American um, versions of it. Um, now, they're actually, it's not as simple as this picture shows. I think that there's lots of evidence to suggest that we have different um, uh, strains of SARS-CoV-2 in our population, especially from the east to west coast. And it may be, for example, these kinds of things are interesting because it may explain why some countries have higher death rates than others, why the, the virus does more damage to the lungs in some places than others, right? Uh, and that's the kinds of questions these guys are asking. So that's a really interesting site to look at. Um, and um, that's, of course, not the genomes. It's just basically the analysis from the genomes. Uh, another ni nice resource is the UCSC genome browser, which we saw once before um, in an earlier lecture. In this case here, you see um, the same phylogeny from T Trevor Bedford along the uh, y-axis over here, and this is the stretch of its genome from zero to around 33,000 base pairs. I believe, I think that were zoomed out. I'll zoom out a little bit more. And um, you can then basically, yeah, get right in there to any one of the genes that sit along this, this genome, uh, zoom into it. For example, I can zoom in uh, down to the base pair level, right down to the base pair level. Um, and I can, um, I should be able to see here, yeah, I can see the individual nucleotides um, as I walk along, along or these are amino acids actually, as I walk along the um, genome. And the nice thing about the UCSC genome browser is that it provides these so-called tracks, it's the way things are organized. Each row here is a different track. And um, you can ask for all sorts of different information uh, or you know, either or, or hide it, you know, or, or sort of highlight it. Uh, so it's kind of a use, that's a really interesting, powerful way of, in, of uh, exploring genomes. Okay, um, so in fact, there are a few different tools out there for visualizing genomes. Uh, not too surprisingly, they break generally um, by the different uh, big uh, repositories and centers. So uh, your largest one really is the NCBI genomes and maps tools. Uh, if you come into here, you'll see there's, uh, this is the NCBI genomes and map. If you click on genome, you'll, you can then choose um, to browse by organism, say, and you can pick whatever you'd like. I mean, you can come in and ask for uh, Homo sapiens, for example. Oops, if you spell it correctly, it'll work better. Yeah, come in. And now um, I should be able to now see Homo sapiens uh, in the click on chromosome name. Okay, yeah, sorry. I have to click on the individual chromosome name. Yeah, and now uh, I'm in chromosome one. And it doesn't look too much different than the UCSC genome browser. Um, 
it's uh, perhaps not quite as, it's a little bit prettier in some ways yet. And there is this ability to add tracks of different types like the UCFC browser and um, control uh, what you do see or don't see and integrate from different sources. So, and, and you can even choose which assembly of the human genome you want, etc. So it's not very much different in the end from the UCSC browser. It's just a preference, I think, for the most part. Well, the second browser is the UCSC genome browser, and you're already familiar with it to some extent, so I won't spend much time here. But like the, um, unlike the NCBI, not every organism is there. It covers, for sure, all of the classic model organ organisms per se, and, and many more, but uh, it's not as complete. It has a nice interface though, for sure. Okay, and, um, and then there's the European effort um, ensemble, which we haven't talked about much in the course. It started with human and then branched out to other vertebrates, and, and now it has um, versions for, whoops, I'm sorry. Just uh, hit the wrong button there. Uh, for um, bacteria, fungi, plants, protists, metazoa. But like the UCSC browser, it's not as comprehensive as uh, the NCBI. But the interface is certainly quite nice. And we'll come back to that in a little bit to talk about Biomart. Uh, finally, uh, there's things like the Integrative Genomics Viewer from the Broad. Um, it's uh, not a repository of, um, of genomes, or if it is, there's a few genomes perhaps available, uh, but it's a nice, this is a particularly nice tool for exploring gene expression data, so from RNA-seq. Uh, this is coming from Jill Mezerov's lab. Uh, and so, um, yeah, okay, so the first three here uh, are really also repositories for genomes, and also, they're annotations of these genomes, right? So, you know, it's one thing to have the nucleic acid sequence for each chromosome uh, across the genome and, and get access to that. But, you know, you also need to know where the genes are. You need to know where the um, where specific, specific binding sites or enhancers are. Uh, you need to have all that kind of um, annotation of where um, repetitive regions are or telomeres, centromeres, etc. So, um, it's not just the genome itself. And all three of these sources provide that extra information, both the genome and its annotations. So where we're going with this is to be able to ask more sophisticated questions that static visual um, uh, to software tools can't provide. So if we were to ask a question like, what binding sites are in the promoter of gene X? You know, it, there might be a database out there for whatever organism you're working in that has that. But if you has that information, um, perhaps for like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, a really well studied model organism, the database SGD, um, Saccharomyces genome database, would have the information of what known um, binding sites there are for each promoter um, in across the genome. But for a lot of organisms, that wouldn't be the case. And we would have to go and try to computationally find those binding sites, for example. And that's something we're going to do in a few lectures. Um, same thing for enhancers of genes. So I use that example because enhancers aren't nearly well, as well understood as binding sites. And they're scattered very far distal to um, genes. It can be 100,000 base pairs upstream of a gene or downstream of a gene that affect DNA superstructure. Um, so, so that usually that takes some kind of modeling and some sort of, you know, takes sophisticated tools to, um, to investigate those large genomic regions. Uh, or how do transcription factors start, how do transcription start sites change across the genome? If I wanted to look at every, you know, uh, TSS for every gene at the same time, you know, you know, maybe there's a database out there for that one particular organism, but it's likely not the case that such a database exists for every one of your questions. Um, you know, if you want to basically go to investigate the cut sites for some specific restriction enzyme, then, you know, you need to go in there and computationally find them yourself. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that 
later today, actually. Okay, so um, here we're back to basically getting this data back into our into R so that we can uh, manipulate it with the full um, hammer that is programming, right? That really powerful tool. So just to uh, make sure we know, whoops. Um, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. So just so that we know where we are here, um, you know, we're really upstream uh, different sources of for genomes up here and their annotations. Uh, and that can come, we just spoke, what we just talked about was basically the NCBI, uh, the UCSC, and um, the third one, Ensemble. Now, we're not going to go here to today towards tidy data. That's not quite the right notion. There is, we're going to start by talking about how to get that, those genomes onto your drive, whether that's your actual physical drive or the clouds drive, and then how to get that data into, um, into R. And well, it won't be tidy data, but it will be other um, packages that are out there that have been especially developed for molecular sequence data. So uh, there's some um, different ways to download. That's the first step of the import. How do you get your genome that you want and the annotation? Um, the, f the first place with the NCBI might be uh, a good place to start, if, especially if you're not um, you're dealing with an organism that's not well studied or, or not a classic model organism. And for example, you could come in here and go to download FTP, and you'll see that there's an entry here for GenBank. Um, and if I click on that, I might want to pick something like a fungi, and I might choose um, within fungi. I can see the list of all available fungi, and there's an awful lot of them, the Aspergillus, etc. Uh, maybe I'd be interested in my favorite guy, Candida albicans, something we study in the lab. And if I go into Candida albicans, I can start to see that um, there's a number of files available for that um, specific uh, organism. And I could go into, for example, latest assembly versions. Um, and as I was saying a little bit earlier, a lot of organisms have multiple strains um, sequenced for them. So in this case here, you see that there's several different Candida albicin strains. Uh, it is a human pathogen, so some of these strains are, well, probably these strains did, uh, were isolated originally from um, a, a human who had the disease uh, and made into lab strains. Like here's, for example, Candida albicans S35314. We work with that version three. And if I go into there, now I'm kind of really down at the core here of the files that I need um, for uh, exploring and, and, um, the data. So let me see here if I, I think I have slides for this now. Uh, yeah, that's the Candida albicans um, strain that we're interested in. And if I zoom into here, that's exactly what I showed you just a few seconds ago. And now we're into this game of understanding a lot of different formats for files. Um, we can, for now, uh, ignore the assemblies. Candida is well assembled, and we're not going to worry about the quality of the assembly. But you have some terminology that we really need to learn. And one of them might be, for example, the CDS from genomic. So CDS stands for coding sequence. So this is the coding sequence from the genomic FNA. So that's FASTA nucleic acids. Um, FNA, FASTA nucleic acid. So this file will have the nucleic acids uh, for um, uh, all the coding regions of the genome. Recall the .gz, that is your GNU zipped that we had to unzip. Remember we used gunzip in the um, Unix window on our studio. And this file here is exactly, I just opened it up here to show you what it looks like. This is a FASTA format. It starts with this um, uh, greater than symbol right there. So you can see there's different entries, right? Uh, there's three entries on this. This, this is probably a very long file. Um, and then there's some information here about, um, I guess the first thing, uh, it, it's basically an identifier of what 
what gene it is in the candida genome, uh, what locus it's in, that's a code for a locus. It says that it's a hypothetical protein. And then it'll give you some extra information like um, uh, here its location is from like one to 54 nucleic acids, uh, what chromosome it's on, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's not the genome per se, that's the coding regions from the genome. If I come down here, like feature count table, feature table, I wanna, I'm not sure I remember now what, what, things I, what slides I had prepared. Um, no, I don't have other slides for those, but uh, we can go through them quickly here. Like you have genomic um, FASTA nucleic acids. Maybe I can, no, I can't zoom in on that, I'm sorry. But um, that's FASTA FNA, so that's your FASTA nucleic acid. You also have here um, a GBFF, which I think is GenBank uh, feature, form, feature format, and GFF with generic feature format, and then GTF with this gene transfer format. To be honest, I don't know what all these formats are, okay? It's basically the same information. It's all the genomes, but the genome is being made available in, I think, four different ways. I honestly, I just go for the FNA. I always go for the FASTA files because it's a simple, um, it's a simple structure. Uh, the GenBank, you know from previous courses, yeah, I, I think, um, well, let me show you what a GenBank, in general, what, what it's gonna look like uh, is something like, uh, let me see if I can just zoom right in quickly on something like HSP90 at GenBank. Um, a GenBank file looks something like this, right? It has lots of different fields, uh, lots of different information about that gene. And then that's what you'd have to get into, um, into R. Almost always, there is some parser out there, a package that's available in R for reading in these different formats, whether it's um, uh, GenBank or GFF or GTF. Um, and, other, and they also make here, for example, the FAA, which is the FASTA format for amino acids. Um, so they basically translate it, and that comes in different formats. GPFF, which I guess would be the generic protein um, feature format. Uh, and then of note here, we also have, for example, well, the RNA version of transcripts. That would be the, probably transcripts that are, that, you know, so different isoforms of the gene, um, for example, that might be recorded. But the last thing here is this RM, and um, RM, it's right here, it stands for repeat masker. So sometimes it, it's common um, these days to uh, mask out, which means to basically replace the nucleotides with the letter N in repetitive regions that are like AT, 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 AT a million times, um, because those, those repetitive regions can really cause problems in the analysis downstream. And so you can get these, uh, these uh, files that indicate the locations of all the repetitive regions, and that's usually done by a program called Repeat Masker. The UCSC has a really nice way of, of downloading their files. Um, uh, you, you know, here, uh, I think this is, maybe it's easier to go to the site so you can see it better. If I go into, for example, in this case here, um, S. cerevasia, baker's yeast, I, I get all sort. I can download all sorts of information about, uh, information about it. Um, well, you'll see here, it actually does link back to NCBI, but, and, and SGD, so, you know, the UCSC browsers, are really highly curated, so they're linking back to all the original sources. But, um, and, and it's probably even coming, what they're saying here is that their genome is coming from SGD. Uh, but now, uh, you, you know, you can come in here to downloads and you can choose something like FTP, which is the file transfer protocol. And that's not what I wanted, actually. I wanted um, just, I guess, just genome data, sorry. Yeah, genome data, and um, I can come down here and scroll. That's the human. I could just search on Sarah, yeah, on yeast, and then I can see there's been three assemblies at least available to me. 
the genome sequence files are available here. Um, and then this breaks down, and again, you get lots of codes, FA, which is the FASTA format, and then some other ones that I have, you know, that I haven't seen before, like 2-bit, which is a compressed version of the, um, the, uh, the um, FASTA formats, etc. Again, I usually just go for the FASTA formats because I know that there are parsers to bring that information into R when I need to, but sometimes those other files also have value. But um, you know, the, the standard thing here is that uh, um, whether it's a two-bit file or a bed file, etc., almost always I found that um, uh, R will have some package that can bring that data from your disk or from the, um, the cloud's disk into your session and put it into a data structure. Um, Bed files are also, that's a term you're going to hear a lot, um, especially if you're doing next generation sequencing. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to uh, store every fragment of DNA returned by a sequencer. It's enough just to store the indices of that read into the reference genome. That's a lot more compact, right, than actually storing the sequence data itself. And there's a really nice resource at... Um, uh, the UCSC in general has great documentation and they explain all these different formats in a nice way. I think it's the next slide that, yeah, these are some data formats. I'm not going to go through them here. Y you know, I just want to say that data formats, of course, are tricky. They, they, they keep coming up, cropping up and data formats are basically, of course, standards in the field, right? They're, they're agreed upon formats, but they compete with each other to some extent. They're, they're slightly different. One can be better, one, some are better for some things than others. There's no clear winner, so you just end up having to learn a lot of these formats. Um, and that's kind of just a fact of life in bioinformatics still to this day. Uh, but this, there's a nice link here to this file, um, and uh, so the frequently the, the facts, the frequently asked questions, uh, and there's like a really nice explanation of all of these different formats that you're going to come upon. And I find that's a really useful resource to have. It's all in one spot. Okay. So also, I just wanted to have a, make a quick note about um, some notation when, when you hear the human genome being referenced. Um, there's at least three different versions of the human genome uh, that are available. Now, uh, one of them is uh, from the, the genome reference, the GRC. Okay, That, uh, to me, is the one that I mostly used. Um, and it's GRC, and right now we're at H38. I think that was, I think we're still at H38. I don't think there's been a 39, but I, that, that actually seems maybe incorrect. That was the last time it was released, so about a four-year window. You can see two to, well, one year, then two years, then three years, now four years. So um, so when, when you go this direction and you ask the question, why are there multiple ones? It's just because those assemblies are getting better and better. They're filling in missing regions that weren't sequenced um, yet or had problems, right? Largely because of you know, repetitive uh, regions, etc. Now, the UCSC also has its version of the um, GRC. And, I, you know, I, I think online you can find some um, explanations, especially if you go to Biostars. I don't know if you've seen this, but Biostars is sort of like a stack overflow just for sequencing data and genomes. And I think the explanations are kind of technical of what's different between the UCSC and um, the GRC. They, they, you know, I think it's how, how they, whether they mask out the repetitive regions or not, um, how they handle certain uh, bases that weren't sequenced very well, like do they put uh, an N there, meaning undetermined or, you know, and and I, and I believe that the other, the other big thing is how they deal with the mitochondrial genome in human cells. And it's had its evolution too that's been in sync with the GRC. Now there's a third one from the Broad Institute um, and I've never used that one. I, I think that they're all roughly the same. 
But I, I think though the problem is that if you say uh, my gene HSP90 is located on chromosome five, okay, that's going to be true across all three of them. But then if the second part is that it says like, well, it's at position 1032 in the P arm in version in, in GRC38, it might not be at 1032 in HG38, it might be at 1040, right? It might be slightly different. So those, those references, referencing within the genomes, those small differences um, add a bit of complexity to people's daily life in, in uh, bioinformatics, let's say that. Okay, so the first step, of course, like we've already done with the data wrangling, is how to get um, get things to your hard drive into R. So before, you know, you would um, uh, you'd start by using FTP or WGET uh, on the machine that you want the data stored at. Um, I think your default is NCBI because basically it has everything in every format. Now, once it's at your machine, getting the data into R, of course, can be a bit tricky. Uh, but I hope that by this point in the course, you have a feeling of how you would actually get those files to uh, a, raw, like a raw directory in your R Studio session. That should be pretty easy now. Okay, and then, you know, how do we get it in this part here? Okay, so... The basic thing again is that almost every format has an R package that reads it in. Um, one really nice package is called Seek in R. Uh, it's a helpful package. It has a lot of different functions um, for reading in FASTA files, for example, um, and some basic definitions like the IU, IUPAC codes for nucleotides, etc. I, I, I suspect it might be a bit difficult to read this. Um, uh, this color scheme here, but you can see that the seek and R package has a lot of functions that you can use. Um, it, it'll translate a nucleic acid sequence into an amino acid sequence with via the genetic code, etc. All these kinds of basic um, functions are in that package. It tends to get used a lot. Okay, um, but then there's other formats that aren't covered by seek and R. Um, if you aren't using the NCBI, but are going to use the ensemble effort, then, um, the, you know, so here I'll just go back to ensemble for a second. This is the ensemble and we might go into human and you'll see that um, up here, uh, you have different ways to download. You can download this way and there's options here. Uh, you can just FTP those files like we did at the NCBI. That would be one. Um, one approach. There's also something that maybe for um, kind of you know heavy users or expert computational biologists, they might use this REST server, and they would that REST server is an API, I believe, that allows uh, your code to call that database directly, um, and that's very close to what this second thing here called Biomart. Biomart is a way of um, selecting data from Ensemble. So you can choose, for example, a specific database like the most um, strain 101, and then you can select, I don't know, uh, the AG, AJ most model. And then, you know, you can keep selecting like this, and then you can download that data uh, either, you know, as an XML file in some sort of format um, and, and get that data down to your hard drive. That's interesting, but the real power is not with Ensemble, I find, is using this Biomart package in R. So this basically auto makes automatic connections to the Ensemble database for you, and you can just ask it for the information that you want. Okay, so I, I have this commented out here. I can't show you the result because I discovered that there's a, there's a conflict between the Biomart package and um, the code that I use, this blog down for making the website. It's a, it's a bug um, in uh, the newest version of blog down and, um, or, you know, somebody has to fix it, but my machine um, stops working. So I, now I tried it on the cloud and this code is over in the cloud in um, project 11 and you can try it out there and it's kind of fun to do because it's, uh, 
It's really just reaching out into the web and grabbing this information. It's straightforward. I load my library, Biomart, and then basically I say use ensemble. Uh, I'm just saying the mart, if you know what the word mart means, you know, we have a, it means a place of gathering to sell, or I think it's like a shopping mall. It's a mart, right? Like a, it's, it means a, yeah, um, like a, I guess like a plaza, right? Where, you know, you can buy things and sell things. And they're using this idea, it's a biomart that you can make transactions. And so here we're asking to use the ensemble database. And if you do that and you ask for the, if you ask for the list of all databases, that's a function this package offers, it's gonna say, you know, homo sapiens and mouse and all the databases that we saw earlier are gonna be available. And, um, whoops, I don't know why that's copied there. But uh, then you can come in and say, um, you know, I want to use this, the Homo sapiens uh, database within Ensemble. And then here I'm asking for just the genes on chromosome 22. So this is get BM, and I don't really remember what BM stands for. Um, but it's calling the Ensemble database through the internet, of course. And it's, asked, it's saying, okay, I want the gene IDs. I want the transcript IDs. I want the human genome nomenclature symbol. If you recall, we talked about this earlier when we talked about the NCBI. This is the official name for the gene. What chromosome it's on, where it starts and where it ends and all sorts of other values. Here I'm specifying I want chromosome 22. And, and when you do this in our studio cloud, you're going to see that this comes back with se the several hundred gene names that are on chromosome 22. And I can repeat that. I can, for example, call different databases like here. I'm asking for the ensemble gene name, transcript like before, but I also ask for the Unip Uniprot Swissprot name. And, you know, that's a different, um, a different database from Switzerland for storing protein information. And this is the identifier for that particular protein that I'm interested in. So it's going to give back all the codes in the databases, all the accession numbers related to that one Swiss prot ID. So that's really handy for looking across different databases. So hopefully that's understandable so far, but you know, that, that um, Biomart package, uh, yeah, the Biomart package really allows you to just, you know, never go on the web yourself, just stay in your R session and grab the information that you want. And it's a pretty easy package to use. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but uh, you know, you just do, you just find, there's lots of examples out there on the web um, and you just copy and paste them and modify them for your own needs. Okay, so then there's a third way to do it. And um, this is really nice too. I like it. Um, it's the BS genome. Um, I, I think it's like bio sequence genome is what it stands for. I don't think it's the best name for a package, but um, it comes from UCSC, and um, the, the, the great thing about this, uh, okay, firstly, not all genomes are available. It's just the same genomes that are in the UCSC browser, right? Okay, and the, the nice thing, though, is that if you recall, the UCSC browser has all these tracks, um, and, and so you can select tracks or hide them or, or make them very prominent, etc., and that's all the annotations. So where the genes are, where the promoters are, the different transcripts that are known for that gene, you know, all sorts of information about that gene expression, polymorphisms, et cetera, you can choose. And so what they have done is they've created a, um, this BS genome package for each organism. Um, I think I have it here as an example. Yeah. So it's, this BS genome is actually a bioconductor package, which you guys are now familiar with, I believe. And um, yeah, BS genome, you see there's one for Homo sapiens, there's one for mouse, for worm, um, you know, fly, uh, plant, you know, mustard plant, et cetera, for, for um, baker's yeast, uh, et cetera. So there's quite a few genomes available. Now, basically they're just packages. There are packages. So, you know, you install that package, on your machine, just like you do an install package of any package, you load that library and suddenly that genome now is available to you. 
Um, and they um, automatically are put into what are called bio strings. And that's yet another package that we're going to talk about and go through today. We're going to show you the bio strings package. And this is um, basically all the, this is the equivalent of the Tibble for genomes. All right. So Tibbles for data science. And here the bio strings is really for storing genomes. Okay. You all know what characters are by this point in the course, but we haven't really discussed them fully, and there's more to them. So if we follow uh, chronologically. The classic R, base R, uh, had a character called class that you know of. So uh, as you know, we can design X to be a character. The rockets are distributing about London, just as Poisson's equation in the textbook predicts. Um, and then once I have that variable x of type character, I can ask its length, so n char of x, number of char characters, and I'll get back 84. And I could ask for a substring, that stands for substring of x, and I can put, then just ask for, of course, the start and the end position. Indexing starts at 1, and so five is going to be one, two, three, four, five spaces count. And the stop is going to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11. And I get back, not surprisingly, rockets, right? So I can take a substring or a sub, sub character of a, 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 a character. So again, if you remember, right from the beginning, I've been saying there's this intermixed um, usage of character and string. And you can see even here in base R, they're calling them strings, but it's a character too. So it's, it's been inconsistent. Um, I can define another string called uh, that has a character. As the data kept keep as the data keep coming in, Roger looks more and more like a prophet. Um, and I can then manipulate that string. For example, to upper will change it all to uppercase. And if I want to get rid of the uppercase. I could use instead the to lower function. So standard things for dealing with characters. Um, now, you guys have seen, I think, some of you, um, the cat function. And it doesn't actually concatenate x and y to make z. So if I run this, what I'm going to get is uh, on the screen, it's going to say the rockets are distributing around about London, just as Poisson's equation in the textbooks predicts. And then, it's a, and then it concatenates as the data keep coming in, Roger looks more and more like a prophet. However, if I try to assign that back to Z and then I look at the value of Z, it's null. It didn't actually concatenate those two strings. That's because the function cat is more about displaying things on the screen. So it's basically when you pass it parameters like X and Y, it catches those parameters and instead of um, printing it, uh, instead of uh, affecting memory, changing values like Z, what it does is just print that on the screen in a nice way. And you can control the output with tabs and new lines and color using the cat function. It, it's, um, it's just for display. Um, if, I wanted, if I do want to concatenate two strings, I could use the paste function in classic R. So paste x and y, and I can specify a separator, which in this case is both the period and the space. And when I do that, uh, whoops, for some reason I don't see the output. Oh, I, I didn't write the output there on the screen. Um, well, you'll have to trust me here that that will in fact um, concatenate those two st uh, st strings in a nice way. Um, now. Uh, then there are concepts like regular expressions and grep, which I think some of you may have used in assignments already. And this uh, regular expression is a certain type of pattern that you can specify. In this case, it's a really simple one where it's just the two letters O-N in succession. And it'll grep, this, this grep regular expression will search the text Z, which is the concatenation of these two strings, for every time that um, O-N occurs in the string. So watch here, if I go back to the beginning, this is, this is what Z looks like. So this is position one. 
Here it says the first position where there's an ON is 37. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, dot, 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 ON. That's 37. And then another one occurs three, one, three, three later at 40, which is 38, 39, 40. And then another one occurs at 56, which is here. And yet another one occurs downstream somewhere down here. So that's a really handy thing to be able to do is to find substrings, exact matches in, um, in a string. Here, uh, G sub is also a really useful function because it allows you to modify a string. So here I'm saying, take, find the pattern, or take, find Roger in that string. So where is Roger? It's right here, okay? And replace Roger with Mike. And now when I print that out, I, I remembered here the um, parenthesis. Uh, now when I print this out, I can see that it says that Mike looks more like a prophet, right? Rather than Roger. So you can, you know, basically substitute. That's why the sub. Uh, don't, you know, I won't go and show you right now this because these functions are all in RStudio Cloud in the um, source directory. So you can step through them uh, on, on your own time. So then, of course, the tidyverse comes along and makes everything a bit nicer with Stringer. So um, it's not major differences, really. It, it's just more uh, convenient. So if I have X and Y, like, like uh, from the previous slide, my two sentences, I can, they're vectorized, meaning that if I make a, a if I use the C combined operator on X and Y, now I have those two strings um, in a vector. And now if I apply string length to them, I'll get back 94 and 69 for the length of um, each of these two strings, respectively. Um, yeah, uh, I guess they were on the previous page, but uh, well, the first one was 94. See, okay, don't need to beat that to death. Uh, and uh, there's some nice properties that it just makes it a bit easier. So one thing is that all of the string functions uh, are the same format. So it's str underscore. So in R, if you just start in R Studio, I'm sorry, if you type in str underscore, the help will pop up and show you um, all the alternative functions that can be applied to strings. In this case here, the combine operator again is used. Uh, this is the combine of X and Y, and I'm gonna put a space dot in between the two sentences. So that's like the paste, right? But of course, I think it's easier to remember ST uh, underscore, STR underscore, and then, you know, look to see what you wanna use rather than trying to remember paste and end length and or end char and substring, et cetera. It's very, you know, I, I mean, the tidyverse, they, it's really well designed that way, right? I mean, you don't need to be stoned to kind of see the beauty of how well organized and you know symmetric everything is in the package. Okay, so for example, here's a silly example, but it's a chance to introduce some more R. Um, pizza is a logical variable. It uh, could be true or false, in this case, true. My number of kids, three. So now I do a string concatenate of okay, my, um, and then the number of kids, um, spawn, comma, we should, and then there's the decision in here, and this is the first time we've seen an if then else statement. So if pizza, then it, if that's true, in this case it is, then this part here is executed. Else, if this is false, right, the opposite, then we eat lettuce. So in this case, because pizza is true, it prints out, oh my, three, spawn, uh, we should, and then it checks if pizza is true, which it is, then order pizza and it prints this out and it doesn't print out that, right? Okay, uh, so that's an if statement and we're gonna see more if statements as we go along. It's a way of choosing. And of course, that's one of the properties of, of modern computing, right? Um, string sub, you know, we had this G sub before, or uh, no, sorry, sub string. So S, so, uh, yeah, so exactly. It was like string, su um, string sub, S T R S U B. I, actually, I don't even remember already. That's the problem with the classic R. It was, uh, um, yeah, sub string, right? S U B S T R. And now in the tidyverse, 
in their format, it's str underscore sub uh, from five to 11 gives me rockets. And I still have my two upper like and two lower and I can sort easily. So if I sort lexical graphically on the first four numbers, I get four, one, three, two. And as I was saying a little bit earlier, if you just type in str underscore, you'll see all of the different options you have um, for dealing with strings in the tidyverse. Okay, a uh, more string view here. Again, I pass it my two strings. And this is interesting because it's an example of a regular expression. The period means, not period, but it means it matches any letter. Um, so here, uh, in this sentence, it'll match uh, any time that you see an O followed by any letter followed by an E. So if we start here and we get to rockets, there's an O, C is any letter, that's good, but the K is not an E and so it's not a match. And if we walk down to this O, it's not a match because that's not an E. Um, that O, that's not an E, etc. The first place it matches is here in Roger. Um, if I wanted to highlight the end of strings, uh, the last two letters and the end, I could do something like this and it would highlight TS and the end and for profits TS, T dot, uh, T period and the end. So um, it's a way of these regular expressions are allow, are allow you to search for complicated patterns in your text. Uh, here's an interesting one. This, these parentheses in a regular expression mean, and this means an or. So basically anytime I match keep, and it could be an S next or not, or not. And so here you can see that as the data keeps coming in or as the data keep coming in, um, either one would match this, uh, this occurrence uh, in, in the sentence. So, it, you know, for another example would be like, um, you would use that for is the differences between, say, English and um, or British and American English would summarize as an S or a Z. You would put an S here and a Z here, and it would accept either one. Regular expressions are very handy. And we won't do them in the course, take them. But if you ever have a bored moment and you want to really learn something useful, it, it search it is to learn. Um, it's kind of an art to learn these um, regular expressions. They've been around forever. It comes from regular expressions come from something in computer science called the finite state automata. Uh, finite state automaton. Um, they're kind of a special class of um, of uh, patterns that um, are simple to find. Okay, but you know, neither the base R nor stringer uh, packages functions um, are really built for long genetic sequences. They're, they're designed for a small English text. Uh, because genomic data is bigger, you need efficient data structures to store them properly. Uh, and, you know, uh, once you've stored them, of course, there are special functions that would be nice to have for um, genetic sequence data. For example, commonly we're asking for the watson crick complement of a nucleic acid sequence. So a function that computes that quickly would be nice. Commonly, we're trying to take a nucleic acid sequence and translate it via the genetic code. So a function for that would be nice. Of course, that's biology specific, so it's not going to be in the base R or string or tidyverse packages, right? So BioStrings is really that package. It's been around for a while, and it's for manipulating long genomic strings. Okay. So BioStrings, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a class for DNA string, for RNA string, and for amino acid string. I'll just show you some examples on DNA string here. They're all uh, examples of generic, uh, of more generic classes called B strings, or biological strings, and X strings. I'm not going to go into those today, but that leads towards something called the S3 and S4 objects that we are going to have to talk about down the road, not today. So, you know, we would, inst it's a bio, uh, bio strings is a bioconductor package. Okay. So we would load the library after downloading it 
And, and it's as simple as this. I'd say DNA string uh, is equal to um, uh, this here. So GCGATN dash or gap CTC. Uh, and what you'll get back is something that says it's a DNA string and it has 10 letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this counted as a character, and n counted as an character. Character. Uh, so there's a lot of things to explain here. One thing might be is like what you might say. Why, why have I written it that and not written it as um, my classic? Uh, you know, boom. And the answer is that they are exactly the same thing. Uh, well, for our purposes, they're the same thing. I don't like to use this because it's too close to this and you know I don't like that because um, you know I think when you write the assigns to this way it's clear that you mean assign to even though you can get away with writing the single equal sign this of course is your test for equality right so they're, they're very different things um, okay so yeah hopefully that's understandable um, where's my, my trusty pizza? I might have made it a pizza. Okay, now a couple other things. Um, you say, well, why is there an N? That's not a nucleic acid. And the, the answer is that there is kind of what's called the IUPAC um, code uh, for what different nucleotides mean. And N, it means undetermined, I believe. So we're not sure what nucleotide that really is that's that happens a lot because the sequencer is not very you know can make mistakes or the signal is not very um, clear and so we assign an n there instead of a c g or t let me show you the the iupac um yeah this is how they're all explained n is any base or not really you know so in other words if you're not sure you put that that way uh, there's other codes like R, which is either an A or a G, Y, C, or, so all combinations, right? A, C, G, or T is a B. I, I don't even know these things, right? I mean, I'd have to look them up every time. But, so they have those codes there. Um, the most ones that I see is, an, is the N, because sequencers often don't successfully, whoops, why did I do that? Okay. Um, Sequencers often aren't perfect. That's cool. I never. Um, no, I lost my pizza though. Sorry, learn something new every day. Uh, the last thing is, what is this thing? And and that represents a gap. Um, it's a bit hard to explain right now, but it means that there's a, uh, in a sense, a nucleotide missing there, and it's usually related to evolutionary studies because in some other species that has the same sequence as this it has some nucleotide here and this species has lost that nucleotide somewhere along the evolution between the two uh, so we'll, we'll come back to gaps later and then and, but the, the thing is here in, once it's in a bio string you can do some nice things quickly like you can ask what is the frequency of each nucleotide um, so you pass it your dna string um, I only want to consider A, C, G, or T. I'll summarize all the rest as other, and I want probabilities. And so basically, 30% of my nucleotides in this sequence, one, two, three out of 10 um, is, uh, so how does that work? It's, it's 30, yeah, so three out of 10, um, one, two, three, and it's 10 letters overall, sorry, so 30%. There's only one A, 10%, um, and the other is this gap, which is 20%, and, sorry, this gap, and this N, sorry, it's getting a little bit unclear. This 20% here corresponds to the N and to the gap, okay? All right. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you, we're often asking what the frequency of different bases are in a sequence and that's the kind of typical function that you have defined now for uh, genetic sequences um, other things like you could say okay i want the reverse complement of the dna string so if this is my string my reverse complement is going to be g the watson crick complement of t is an a 
G goes to C, okay, N goes to N, A goes to T, A goes to T, C goes to G, uh, G goes to C, and finally G goes to C. So it's the Watson Crick, you, you know, your two strings get um, reversed and the Watson Crick complement is taken uh, of, of this strand here, okay? Uh, I can do substring. Substrings are a bit uh, easy here. I can ask just for, say, the eighth base. That would be a C. I think that's pretty clear. If I count out, that's going to point to this guy here. I can take from 4 to 10, so I'm going to get back ATN-CTC. That's 4 to 10 there. Nothing, not rocket science at all. Pretty straightforward, I hope. Um, and you can do things like test for equality, like my original DNA string is equal to um, the reverse complement of the reverse complement of itself. I guess that's true. So it's like saying x is equal to not not x for logicals. And then there's some nice functions like this uh, view um, here. Uh, I can ask for um, a view of my DNA string. Um, and I say start is 3 and from 3 to 0 and the end is from 5 to 8. And so what you get, I believe, is 3 is going to be... Where's my string? Oh, it's on the previous slide. G-A-T. It starts with 3, then it starts with 2, then 1, then 0, right? And the end goes from 5, 6, 7, 8. It is descending. And so my width is actually uh, increasing, right? And if I go back from 3 to 5 and I look at the substring from 3 to 5, I'm looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 3 to 3 to 5. And the next one is going to be, what, 2 to 6, I believe. So that should be CGATN. Yeah, CGATN, right? So you have a way of looking at like um, an expanding or contracting window depending on how you set this up. In this case here, it's, it's getting, it's moving to the left and this one is moving to the right and it's getting progressively bigger. And, and those things, well, you, I guess you just have to trust me. I mean, those things for now, but those kinds of functions really are handy when you're looking at molecular sequence data. Um, you're often trying to kind of like, you know, check out substrings and see what's there. Okay. Um, and there's also a notion of a set of sequences, which is really handy. For example, with next generation sequencing, we have a huge set of reads um, from the genome. So in this case here, it's not too big. It's just, I made these up, just four different um, DNA fragments that I concatenated here and made this into a DNA set string. And that's the, that's the new thing here. It's the same thing as a DNA string, but now it, it, it's, it's a set. So if I ask for the alphabet frequency, of DNA seeks, right? These four guys. Um, now I have four vectors. This is for this guy. This guy is the first one. This guy now is for the second one, right? And I can then compare the change in frequencies that are occurring along my chosen set of um, sequences. Okay, um, so that's straightforward. Now it gets more interesting though when you start to actually load in genomes and let's do that right now. We'll end today's lecture in this direction. Um, as I talked about earlier, um, UCSC has these really nice BS genome structures that have the complete genomes ready as an R package. So here I can call this, well at first I install it by it's a bioconductor passage package and then I call the library. So now this is for S. cerevisia baker's yeast from the UCSC and then that's some code for probably a version of it. And now um, I can say that yeast1 is assigned equal to S. cerevisia dollar sign chromosome 1. So when I loaded this library this variable is now accessible to me. You know that's the name of the organism. I don't, it's like that for all of the packages, I believe. It, the name of the organism that's here is the name of the data structure that's there. 
And so I can ask, what's the class of yeast one? And I can see it's a DNA string from the BioString package, right? Okay. Yeah, then we can start to do our normal data science uh, already on the BioString. And I won't go through all the code here, but I think this is a really good opportunity for you uh, for practice to try and go through this code. I, I have a for loop in here. Um, and see if you can understand what's going on in this little um, uh, chunk of code. It produces the following plot, uh, ggplot, which um, breaks down the nucleotide frequency per chromosome, which you can see varies a tiny little bit between chromosomes, except for chromosome 17. Actually, that's the mitochondria. Uh, and it has quite a radical de uh, decrease in CG frequency. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for today. Um, just a couple points of reflection, really. Which organisms, uh, well, it's a good thing. Which organism has the largest genome? Maybe you can take a look for that. And ask yourself why that organism would have such a large um, genome. Uh, why would it evolve that way? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you could ask, what's the smallest genome out there? Just some Google searches, etc. Uh, what are the advantages of special data structures for genomes and molecular sequence data? Uh, I think it's a fair question, right? You know, to think about a little bit. Why can't we just use either base R or classic R for representing a genome? I want you to think a little bit, maybe at this point, um, we've only talked about the genome itself and getting it into R. So you know that there's several chromosomes typically. Uh, each chromosome is quite large. Um, you should respect that a, a human genome at 3.6 billion base pairs might be really challenging for a lot of your small computers and laptops to handle. I don't think all of it could be entered into memory at once for most of them. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe, it, but it might be very slow on your machines, right? Uh, so think about that. But then remember when you go back to those UCSC browsers especially, uh, there's a lot of extra information, right, about where the genes are, the promoters, um, all sorts of other information, polymorphisms that are associated with disease, lots of different questions. Um, so that data has to be imported too, and we haven't talked about that yet. So how do we get that data in, and how do we represent the annotations of a genome? So there's representing the genome, or the chromosome, as long linear structures, and we have biostrings for that. But what's the right way to annotate all those uh, additional information about what's in the genome? Right? So well, let's leave it there, and I'll see you in the next class. Thank you very much, guys. Take care.